Well, for more, we're joined in the studio now by Nisim Rubin, the assistant director of the American Jewish Committee's Asia Pacific Institute, and Dr. Ram Fishman. He's a faculty member for public policy at Tel Aviv University and deputy director there of the MANA Center. Uh, Nisim, if I could start with you. Sure. Uh, of course, many elements playing a role, but basically what has turned around the Israel-India relationship at, from the days when really India's head of the non-aligned movement was one of the most severe critics of Israel. Shalom and namaste. Thank you for having me here. It's a, I think the end of the Cold War uh, in 1990, the beginning of uh, opening of ties between Israel and Russia, China, India, opened these new avenues. And especially in India, it is all, across party lines, there is a realization that Israel is indeed a key strategic ally. And I think there was one incident that Indian uh, politicians and defense panelists cannot forget. In 99, when India was facing the Kargil war with Pakistan, where Pakistani terrorists had got into the Kargil hills, and India was not losing, but uh, not pro winning either, the defense minister's director general came to Delhi and said, tell us what you want, we'll see about the price later. That gave the confidence mm -hmm. to Indian uh, you know, leaders and politicians and defense planners that Israel will stand by us in our hour of need. Mm -hmm. And uh, when India did the nuclear tests in 99, and almost the entire Western world put sanctions, only four mm -hmm. countries did not put sanctions, Israel, Russia, France, so the only three countries. Okay. So. Uh, Dr. Fishman, I know you're an expert in areas of sustainability, water, agriculture. These are key areas for Israel-India cooperation. What does India want out of Israel in these fields, and how much can Israel give to it? India has hundreds of millions of farmers, and every one of them is desperate for water to irrigate their crops. India has to increase its productivity. Um, its water resources are running out. Um, the climate is changing. Mm -hmm. So India really needs a revolution in the way it uses water, in the way it grows crops. And Israel has that experience. Israel has that technology. So that's why it's a key item on the agenda for this visit and for Indo-Israeli relationship. Mm -hmm. Israel um, has a lot to offer, by the way, sure. not just in terms of its technologies, but also in terms of its spirit of innovation, entrepreneurship, its young people. And so young Israelis and Indians together, the private sector, government, and academia working together, can really make a uh, uh, breakthrough in this regard. Uh -huh. Listen, getting back to you just a second, Prime Minister Modi, you spoke about India's change. What is it about Prime Minister Modi individually, specifically, that makes him, it, it really, it seems, a, uh, an advocate of building this relationship with Israel? You know, I come from the state of Gujarat, mm -hmm. where there's still a small community of 120 Jews living there. And Prime Minister Modi, before 2014, was the chief minister of our home state. And my family and the community has known him since those days. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Modi has been, uh, as Chief Minister of Gujarat, has been fascinated by Israel's expertise. You know, his slogan of more crop per drop came after his visit to Israel in 2006. Yes, we're relating, yes. Yes. And uh, also, he has been a strong encourager of diaspora relations. That's what the American Jewish Committee has been at the forefront of building diaspora mm -hmm. ties between. Uh, Jewish and Indian Americans in the United States. There is a lot of goodwill that exists in the 30 million strong Indian diaspora that is politically, economically powerful in key Western countries and the Jewish community. And also in India, uh, the goodwill and support for Israel is the highest in the world. Mm -hmm. A Ynet poll in 2009 showed that 60% of Indians strongly voted in favor of close, warm ties with Israel. Hmm. Okay. Dr. Fishman, goodwill, good intentions, uh, but with India often all the best goodwill and good intentions should sometimes founder on uh, the bureaucracy of India, of the political problems, the internal political problems, the divisions in the country. Is it going to be possible for Israel to make those inroads you talked about faced with these kind of obstacles? It's definitely not going to be easy. It's a huge challenge, but let's keep two things in mind. First of all, um, 20 years ago, everybody kept, say, kept saying about how the Indian economy is never going to grow. 20 years later, we see amazing achievements in India in terms of economic growth. It's true that more news needs to happen, especially in the era of agriculture, is one of the lagging sectors. So it's not going to be easy, but India has the 
resources, the spirit to do it. And Israel definitely has the innovative spirit, the technology. I think those two countries working together can work together to try and do something very hard. But it's not just an Indian-Israeli issue, it's a global issue. How to make agriculture in developing country really thrive in a sustainable way. So it's a strategic need for Israel to be able to play a big role in this. And this could, play, this could have implications for the entire world. So I think it's going to be very hard. But if anybody can do it, I think that this partnership can, can do it. Well, I believe just to both of you. First of all, politically, how far this, can this relationship go? The Prime Minister Netanyahu talks about the sky is the limit. Is, is, is India, for example, at the, at, at the United Nations going to defend Israel in the face of attacks uh, regarding its Palestinian policies? I think Prime Minister Netanyahu is very right. The sky is indeed the limit as far as the ties go economically, militarily, but also the people-to-people -people ties. At the international fora, I think India will be more cautious, although we have seen a uh, significant shift in before India used to lead uh, on anti-Israel resolutions, now India has started abstaining, and that is a hugely a huge step for India, going by its past records. But uh, given the constraints that India has, with about seven million workers in the Gulf, 80% uh, of its energy needs coming from the Persian Gulf, I think you will find India more nuanced. I think uh, you will find India's position at the uh, international fora vis-à-vis -vis Israel closer to that of Germany than that of the United States. And in terms of more in your field, Dr. Fishman, water especially, such a huge problem for India uh, over the years. Uh, many ambitious programs, again, have run in front of how, how far can it really go in the short term, even? These things will not come easy and they won't happen very quickly. It really requires patience, long term planning, it requires resources, it requires innovative thinking. The old models are not going to do it. But I think that's what both Indians and Israelis excel at. So bringing together, again, young students. We have so many Israelis going to India all the time. If a fraction of those students devote their, their energies, their innovation um, to this challenge, it will help a lot. Private sector and government working together. But the scale is so big for Israel. Israel has is done one this year, but it's small. India, it's but we are great with ideas, developing ideas that then get scaled up in a big way. So we have to keep in mind all the time when we think about this, let's find the right model. Mm -hmm. And the right model, a scalable model, can transform an entire country, not alone. India is going to be the leader in this. We can help with our experience, but India is going to have to lead it, and we have to stay focused on the big picture, the scalable models, finding the right model, not just the technology, the business model, the policy. That's where the challenge is. Okay, well, India, that's certainly the big picture here. Dr. Ram Fishman, uh, Nisi Mubin, thank you for being with us on The Rundown today.